here with us on live now from Fox right now. Terry, good morning to you. How are you doing? Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, I want to start off by discussing the remarks that we heard from Gabby's family yesterday. We, we weren't sure how the press conference would go this time yesterday. So after watching those remarks, you know, what messages can people get from this family after they have now officially lost a daughter? Yeah, I think the main thing that I took away from it was obviously they rallied together as a family, which you always like to see. You know, no one's trying to point fingers and they're rallied around a cause. And it's about Gabby. And from the tattoos that are matching to just even saying we want to help other people that are in this situation. That is part of the beginning of the healing process because you feel so out of control in the first stage of shock, you know, where you just, you need to do something. You need to be busy and involved in the process. And finding her was that first hurdle, but now what do they do? So they're doing exactly what I would suggest they do, which is get involved when they can, let the police and everybody else figure out what all happened. But it, this is all about Gabby, their family and her memory. Absolutely. And, you know, what can you say, Terry? I mean, obviously, we've reported from the very beginning how much national attention this case has mm -hmm. garnered. Why does a case like this touch people that don't even know the Petito family or Gabby? Well, this is what trauma and grief brings in our lives. And, you know, I heard some of the stories earlier of people that came there and they become very emotional and they didn't even know Gabby. Um, but this is the difference between what I call a wound and a scar. And this is how you know if you've healed from a past trauma. Because if you can think about that situation and it doesn't bring you back to that ground zero experience, you're probably still in a wound state, which means it's still raw and you probably didn't go through all the stages of grief and heal. And there's a lot of people walking around all around us that have trauma from all kinds of things, from you know sexual abuse to relational abuse to conditions of war with veterans, which I do a lot of and write about, and how do we help these individuals in the grief process. So it, it's all of this combined emotion that when we identify with it, it opens that up like it's fresh for us. So it, I think it's very telling that when people can see that we relate to some part of trauma in our life, that we want to not just heal from, but help others do the same. Yeah, and Terry, going off of exactly what you just said and kind of going back to the Petito family here for just a second, mm -hmm. yesterday we saw them call on Brian Laundrie to turn himself in. So I know that in a sense they have closure knowing that the body is confirmed to be hers, but do you feel that mm -hmm. this is still such an open wound because the person of interest has yet, yet not been located? Yes, this is this is where it really gets tricky in the grief process, especially where there's this type of trauma and, you know, blunt trauma and found a body. It's almost like you've stitched part of the wound up, but the other part of the stitch to complete it all the way through is, you know, finding the perpetrator. And it just helps the psyche. You know, the first part of the grieving process is if you can find a body you know of that loved one it helps you to know it's her it starts the closure process the other part is getting some kind of closure to what happened in some cases people never find closure they have to create their own so this will be an ongoing story and there's different levels and systems of grief that people go through and there's stages of grief and it's basically a past reality transitioning to a new reality a new normal and that takes months to go through so hopefully they can find out what happened more you know get this to an end that the family and the community can start healing completely yeah and you know when it comes to a community what can you say about the support that they have received from we've heard neighbors speak we've heard the public just come forward with all of these tips so in a case that has garnered such national attention like that why is the public's help so important well, you know, I, you know, we live in Florida, you know, I mean, you know, she lives in Florida, they lived in Florida, we do a lot of hurricanes here, like other states, but we do a lot. So we have a lot of preparedness here because of that thing that happens, you know, through these months. 
And it's it's always interesting uh, to see neighbors that may not even talk out cutting each other's trees and helping each other clear roads. People want to rally around people to do good things, even though there's so much negative that goes on in our world in the press today. There's also a lot of positivity. And unfortunately, this kind of thing can bring communities, neighborhoods, i.e. the world together to say, look, that could have been my daughter. You know, that could have been my child. And that touches everyone someplace. So I think it's great to see communities come together to support families like hers uh, in this time of process. And Terry, I want to go back to something you touched on in the very beginning, the fact that this is still such an ongoing situation and this family may never recover from the loss of a daughter, but they are already working to help other people who may be in this situation. So what does that say about a next step? Well, you know, you know, the next step is, you know, trauma has degrees, just like grief cycles do. And, you know, there's some people that grieve their entire lives. I mean, I have an adult special needs son, you know, that's never been diagnosed. So I'm a professional griever. <laughs> this is why I trained. This is why I got a PhD. This is why I write books, because I don't even I got to figure it out myself some days. So there's some things that you just never get over. You learn to accept it. And that's the final stage of grief is acceptance of whatever happened. But you got to go through all the stages to get there. And acceptance is not an easy thing. And it's not a one time thing. You do it over and over, sometimes daily, minute by minute, monthly, whenever things approach and come up to remind us of our own grief process, wherever we are in it, we have to accept the fact that we can't control it. We, we can only do what we can with what we have where we are right now. And that is the grief process. Terry, I do want to show our viewers some more video of that press conference yesterday. In your profession sure. watching this, is there anything else that stuck out to you when it comes to the grieving process, how the family is handling the situation? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've, I've seen situations around the world, actually. I've done, you know, grief and trauma counseling from 9-11 to the tsunami in Thailand to the Haiti earthquake years ago to all of our hurricanes and all the cra and military. So I've seen a lot of grief, death and dying, you know, in my career. And I think when people can rally together, especially a family, because sometimes families don't always rally together. They pull apart. You know, one wants to go after what happened and the others want to support their family with what did happen. So one of the things that really stuck out to me is that they were all unified. They all received tattoos like hers. You know, that's that's pretty telling that we are with her. And that is always a great sign when families and communities can come together to celebrate the life of the person who is now gone versus trying to get the answers or to get even with what happened. And it's very healthy. Yeah, I was going to say that is definitely something that stuck out to me, too. The fact that they are not kind of hounding on the laundry family. All they really did was say, please come forward. So that that seemed like a huge, mature way of handling this entire situation. Now, unfortunately, yes. Terry, at the very moment, this is not the only case that we are following that involves a missing person. Uh, we are following mm -hmm. other cases where we don't know the outcome and hopefully these people will be found safe. But what can you say and what advice do you have to families that may find themselves in a, an unknown situation like this? this you know it, it's it's about you know i think what they're also doing is a lot like what john walsh did years ago you know he started on the same journey that i'm gonna go help other families who lose a child like he did and i do the same thing with special needs because of my grief and loss and you know i think it's very healthy that when we can help and lean into our pain heal from it but own it you know, pain is not a bad thing. Pain teaches us not to continue to do what that's doing so we don't have a further injury. So we have a nervous system that gives us pain alerts so we protect a broken arm or a pulled hamstring because if we didn't have pain, we would destroy ourselves. So pain is a very positive thing, believe it or not. It's just knowing what to do with it, where to put it, 
how to maximize it, and how to help others do the same thing. So the story here is we're all writing our life story every day. Abby's family is writing her story in their lives that can touch the world who has had loss and, and damage just like this. Absolutely. And, you know, we actually literally did hear from Gabby Petito's father on social media saying Gabby did touch the world. That was exactly what he said when he posted that picture of her. Uh, one more question for you, Terry, because sure. something that stuck out to me yesterday was the fact that her stepfather said no parent should ever have to bury their child. And we actually saw Dog the Bounty Hunter get involved in this situation yes. specifically because he also lost a child. So what, what can you say about families who have experienced this tremendous loss kind of coming together in a sense? Well, I, I, you know, I think that is the, the community or the, you know, the familyhood of, you know, we used to call it the village, you know, that comes together because it does take a village to raise kids and it takes a village to support families and that village mentality where we we're here to support each other and look we all have grief and loss you know and if you don't you know just get ready because it's just a part of life it's it's a linear system that we're all going to experience but i think you know seeing you know dog the bounty hunter you know people relate to this kind of thing i relate to it i talk to people every day that are in stages of grief so it's knowing that we're all somewhere in a journey of life and pain, but the biggest thing that's that we have to look at is there's recovery from injury and loss. And that recovery process is what we're after for all of our lives. How do we recover? Look, we're all recovering from something. You know, no one's going to survive life. Life has a hundred percent mortality rate. It's just when, how, and where. And I think as a result of that, celebrating her life, even though it ended tragically, is a very powerful thing to help other people be more aware of their family members, where they are, what they do, and also help them to recover. God forbid these kind of things happen again, and they do. So it gives a community hope and a village kind of care that I think is really powerful. Well, Terry, we can't thank you enough for this insight. I know this has just been such an emotional situation. And like we said, strangers who don't know this family, don't know you know anything about either of them are just still so touched. So we really thank you for coming on here on Live Now from Fox okay. to break down the grief aspect of this investigation. And we really appreciate your time here. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, everybody.